Good morning, everybody. The Football Scoop Podcast is back. We're talking Week 8 preview. I'm very excited about Week 8. I am more excited than Zach Barnett is because Zach's been Debbie Downer a couple times on Twitter and on the website this week. Saying, it's not as great as Week 7. Oh, horseshit. Go away, Zach. This is a great week. I'm very, very excited. We have some incredible ball games, great matchups, great people involved. Uh, I can't wait to see it. I might be even more excited. Last week, I did do a big barbecue competition. We did exceedingly well. We won the cocktail contest. We came in eighth overall, seventh in ribs. We did pretty well. I was pretty excited. 28 teams involved. Incredible. We could talk barbecue all day long, but we're here to talk football. I'm Scott Roussel. i got John Bryce, Zach Barnett, affectionately known as college football experts, because these dudes write stuff just from the top of their heads, and they're right, and they're talking about things that happened 15 years ago. It's incredible. Uh, I am ex- excited to uh, have you guys on. I, I, I got to take a little umbrage. I was not on the podcast Sunday. I listened to the podcast Sunday. There was a moment that I had to stop and, and go, no, that's just wrong. I mean, these guys, are they're right about almost everything. At some point, it was fairly late in the podcast. John Bryce paused and said, well, he's not on the thing, so I'll I'll play his role. I'll be a little bit more handsome version of Scott Russell. Like, no, <laughs> oh, no, no. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, and yes, this is on YouTube, it's pretty clear that's not true. Scott, what do coaches say? The eye and the sky don't lie. Jumping into the games. It's Thursday. We're recording this. We've got great stuff happening tonight. Uh, Virginia, Georgia Tech is happening. I always like Thursday night, Bobby Dodd. I think it's a fantastic environment, to be honest. But the one I want to talk about is a little further south. Troy's coming down, about a three-hour bus ride, I'm guessing. Uh, and they're at South Alabama. Two good dudes, Kane Womack, uh, John Sumrall, both have ex- like very good football teams. These guys are being well coached, good staffs. Uh, I know both are a little beaten up, but they both, they have no bad losses. So Troy uh, went to Ole Miss and lost early on and then had that hail. I mean, I say not, not a bad loss. They had that hail Mary freak loss at app. And then uh, what South's only losses at UCLA a game that I picked them to win and thought they were going to win and they should have won. But anyway, Gentlemen, got any thoughts on this one? Thursday night ball. I think it's just an exciting game for two teams and two programs that have embraced more and more from their football programs and from two coaches that I think we all have a tremendous amount of respect for. Two young guys that have paid a lot of dues that have um, some of the most respect of any of the young coaches out there. And I think this is uh, a great early week, early weekend game. And I think it's also a chance for people – to pay attention and, and really look at two guys that I think have great chances to be power five head coaches much sooner rather than later. So you've got guys that have taken over programs that were in really, really rough shape when they got there. And now both programs are on the cusp of bowl eligibility and of competing for a conference championship. I think it's really exciting. Um, first of all, uh, I think this is the first time in the history of the football scoop podcast that I got gonged before even speaking a word. So that that's a record that will never be broken. And second of all, I mean, you know, this, this is a massive game for both teams. You look at the, the Sunbelt West division, which it, granted is only four years old, but in all four of those years, Louisiana rage and Cajuns won it. And they, they got off to a, a tough start, but I, I'm not willing to, uh, Write the Cajuns off, but the winner of this game is uh, in the driver's seat to win their first division championship, potentially uh, win their first Sun Belt title. Although Troy might have won one a while ago, but South Al- South Alabama hasn't. So I, 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 you know, I got first grade football practice tonight. I'm going to be racing home afterwards to to catch the end of this one because I expect a great game and great atmosphere, in Mobile, and I I think South wins it. Uh, if, if if this game is in Troy, I might pick Troy, but I think South wins it. You know that that. That game at UCLA looks like, you know, potentially one of the best, you know, performances in a loss by any team so far this season. Zach, why are you practicing against first graders? You're like Kramer when he dominated the dojo <laughs> and then he went in there and Elaine got all this confidence from him and he was beating up on kids. What are you doing, Zach? Uh, there's our weekly Seinfeld reference. There we go. I, lo- yeah. I love it. There's nothing wrong with that. I got to tell you guys, this the atmosphere at South's new stadium is fantastic. It's a... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but it's uh, it's everything you want in a in a little small stadium. It, the place will be uh, fairly full. It'll be rocking. 
Uh, it's going to be a great atmosphere. It's going to be good for TV. It's going to show well. So if the Virginia Georgia Tech game's not great on uh, in the NFL, you got the Saints and at the Cardinals, which you know, yeah, good. Don't watch Saints Cardinals. Watch Troy South Alabama. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. The ratings. This one's on the U. Eh. But the ratings could wind up being fantastic for this one. This is a great football game late, I suspect. Uh, I'm excited about this one. Jumping forward to Friday, Tulsa Temple, not one person cares about. UAB, Western Kentucky, also has the potential to be good. Brian Vincent's done a very nice job, you know, take, stepping in, taking over from Bill Clark. Uh, Tyson has got a program that, what, I think they just whipped up on MTSU recently, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's going to be a fun game as well. Yeah, I, the, the thought of any Conference USA team going to the Hilltop or whatever, going to, to Western to win is just scary. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you told me they'd won like 15 straight Conference USA home games, I'd believe you. So I, I'm, I'm taking Western in this one because I, I can't I, – I like UAB a lot. I think they could – you know, Conference USA is going with a divisionless structure this year, so – I think UAB could factor into that. We're going to get to a big conference USA game later, but I, I think Western wins just because I can't pick against them at home. I like, uh, I haven't seen the over for the over under in this game, but I like the over in this game. I expect there to be a lot of points. And Zach, you don't just roll into Bowling Green, Kentucky and beat the toppers, especially with the home of the national Corvette museum, just miles from campus. You're well, no, I mean, it's well known. You don't roll in to Bowling Green and, and come out alive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you're welcome for that uh, cultural event to stop and visit the Corvette Museum. So Stockstill was on fire after they beat Miami, and, and rightfully so. I mean, they went there. What did he say? Something like we just beat their ass. I mean, it was something like that, and they did. I don't. I don't think they've won since. I, he said. He said uh, we got paid like one point. Six million to go play this game and average 1.5 yards a rush. That was what he said. That was he was on fire. He was so happy. I, I really don't think they've won. I think so. Uh, full disclosure, uh, I said I, I believe if Western had won 15 straight home conference games, they actually lost their last home conference game to Troy. So apparently, you can roll into Bowling Green and come out alive. <laughs> All righty, then moving on, let's talk top 25 games on Saturday. I was at Ohio State. Uh, one team can score, the other team doesn't score. Yeah. We could be here a month, and Iowa might not score what they did the last time they played Ohio State. The last time they played, Iowa won 55-24. Like, we, we would have to replay this game a thousand times to get that result. And that was that was all the way back in 2017, I think. I don't believe Iowa has visited Columbus in almost a decade um, Ohio State is playing really, really well, really well. Um, and and C.J. Stroud it continues to be up in the Heisman Trophy discussion alongside anybody in the country. Um, I think that, Zach, we could take Ohio State's output from this game and put it up against Iowa for today and the rest of the month or, or today and all of next month, and it still wouldn't matter. Ohio State rules. Yep. Staying in that 11 o'clock window, Zach pointed out in Nuggets, it happened immediately post-game. It was epic. Hendon Hooker, hey, you just beat Alabama. What's next? We got UT Martin. We're, we're on to UT Martin doing his full bull Belichick. What you expect from a, a 24-year-old, 60-year, is that right, uh, John, college quarterback? So yeah. uh, no no fear of a letdown. They're not the, – the volunteers are not looking past the Skyhawks. No, it's uh, it's homecoming. Uh, I will have something about this on the site a little bit later today, but uh, UT Martin I had a player whose family was completely displaced by the hurricane that ravaged Florida. I think the two schools are collaborating on a fundraiser uh, to help that young man and his family. So that's a, a really neat part about the homecoming game for the Vols this weekend. Also really cool to note uh, the chancellor at the University of Tennessee, Martin, a friend of mine, Keith Carver, his son, Britton Carver, or excuse me, JT Carver, is the number two kicker for the Vols. So it's a family affair this weekend, um, and it's a really cool thing. So uh, it's awesome to see the volunteer spirit alive and well throughout the state as they try to help this young man and his family from UT Martin uh, really overcome a tragedy. Good stuff. 
All right, Syracuse um, has not played the hardest schedule to date. I think we all knew Syracuse's latter half of their schedule was a lot harder. Starts Saturday at Clemson, early early window. Syracuse got a, a really fun offense. I think Robert Nene is 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 a better offensive coordinator, better football coach than most people in America are aware of. He's legit. I still think he should be in the in the conversation for Arizona State. Um. Syracuse at Clemson, boys. What do you think? So this is the biggest regular season Syracuse game since 1959, uh, when they were uh, ranked in the top ten and went to Penn State and won, and went on to, to claim a national championship that year. This is the 25th Clemson game of pitting top 15 teams since 2015 alone. So you have a just like we mentioned with the NC State game just an enormous gulf in big game experience on one sideline. Um, you look at the numbers, they're comparable. You, you look at the numbers, you think, hey, Syracuse can run with Clemson. Obviously, Syracuse's schedule has not been difficult. Clemson's battle-tested. It's at Clemson. Clemson just has better players. So I, I'm going to ride with Clemson. I ex- I'm going to expect Clemson to win this game right up until the final horn sounds and Syracuse has more points. Like, that's what it – like, if it's 48-37 late, I, I'm going to expect Clemson to, to come back and win this game just because that's what Clemson does. I don't I don't think it will be 48-37 no. late. And I don't think it will be um, a one-possession game going into the fourth quarter. Um, kudos to Clemson and, and Dino Babers, if not for – I think you've got to consider Dino Babers as an ACC Coach of the Year, a top ACC Coach of the Year candidate, in my opinion, right now. Um, just like you've got to consider Josh Heupel among the national leaders for that award. But um, much like we talked about Michigan last week, before it dismantled Penn State, the schedule had dovetailed very nicely for the Wolverines. It's done very much the same thing for Syracuse. Um, And now Dino Babers is back to being that guy who's a really well-respected coach whose team plays a really fun brand of ball. And I think he's making a lot of attention. A lot of people turn his way across the country this year that may have coaching openings or that may be thinking about coaching openings because this is the Dino that we've come to expect. But Clemson wins this game going away. Yeah, so I like Clemson to win the game as well. So I, I think we got to pause on the on the Syracuse. I mean, I don't want to take away love from Syracuse, but they're undefeated. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about how they got there. The Louisville thing, Louisville's in shambles that week one. It just wasn't right. Syracuse has housed them. Okay, sure. Yep. UConn, eh, okay, fine. They beat Purdue in that wacky one. You remember that? Yes. Unbelievable finish. Purdue was going to – I mean, it was – Syracuse had the win. Purdue came back. That was crazy. And then Syracuse came back, and it was just unbelievable. That's a solid win. A luck, uh, yeah, a fortunate, but a solid win. Purdue yeah. might win their division. Teetered, right. Yes. Virginia, 22-20. I didn't see anything about the game. I, I, that's all I got. Uh, Wagner, okay, Wagner, great. And then they beat a solid NC State team. So, yeah, okay. their, yeah. Here's, here's where we're going. We got Clemson, Notre Dame, Pitt, Florida State, Wake, BC. Entirely possible they lose every game. They might they might win three of those. They might win all of them. Entirely possible they lose every game. So, we'll the see. Kansas of the ACC. We'll see. We'll see. Kansas, you know, decimated by a couple of yeah. – you lose your quarterback. It changes everything. Anyway, moving on. I like, I like Clemson there. Uh, Cincinnati, SMU. Quick thoughts? So, uh, Cincinnati, if, if Cincinnati wins this game, which I think we all expect them to, Luke Fickle becomes the winningest coach in Cincinnati history, which long, proud history of football at Cincinnati. And Cincinnati ties the AAC record for 19 straight conference wins, which is a held by UCF, a streak that, UC, that Cincinnati broke back in 2019. So, you know, a, a, not a lot uh, that jumps out at you, especially considering the competition in that window, but, you know, a, a potential for a monumental one for Cincinnati. Yeah, and what I've noticed about Cincinnati this week or this season is that the Bearcats tend to play up toward their competition or, or play better in their bigger games. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is a bigger game. I like the Bearcats to roll. <coughs> Talking um... – it is a big deal. Luke Fickle is about to become the winningest coach there because that only happens when the program commits to football. 
right? <laughs> You've got some great coaches come through Cincinnati and then go to on to bigger jobs. Fick has stayed there, and, and they've stepped up their commitment considerably, and now they will have more resources going forward as they enter the conference. But um, it's a big deal for Cincinnati. Plant your flag and say we are and to stay there. Good talk. Let's move along. There's a lot of good games, guys. I mean, I'm telling you, week eight, this is going to produce some epic stuff. Gosh, I want to stay in that early window real fast. A couple other ones. Toledo Buffalo, strange strange game. Could be could be a great game. Give me some quick thoughts there, Zach. Uh, Toledo's. I mean, Toledo fell behind by 21 points last week against. Uh, you know what, what? What I think we all expect think is a solid for the MAC Kent State team and came back and won by 21 points. <laughs> Uh, first place, uh, they're in different divisions, but first place on the line in the MAC. And um, I just think Kent State, or excuse me, Toledo has more explosive offensive potential for this game. So I think they go on the run win. Yeah, I like Toledo. And as you referenced, the offense, it's been particularly potent in some key games this year. And uh, for as bad as Buffalo played early in the season, give Mo Linguist and staff a lot of credit for the way that they've rebounded. Uh, that's very admirable, and this is a home game for them. But I still think that, that Toledo is a bit more established as a whole and especially on the offensive side of the ball. Quick question. Does Duke sneak up on Miami? I'm not they'd be sneaking up on but does Duke have a shot against Miami? Absolutely has a shot, yeah. Look, Duke has essentially been in every single game it's played. We continue to see how well coached they are. Um, just the talent is not where Mike Elko, I believe, will get it. But we see how well coached they are. To me, they remind me a lot of Kansas a year ago um, because you could immediately see the impact of Lance Leipold and Lawrence. You're immediately seeing the impact of Mike Elko and Durham. A middle-of-the-road Conference USA team went to Miami and pushed them around. So everyone has a shot against Miami. I'm with you. Strong statement. Uh, UNLV is at Notre Dame. John, are you going to this one? I will go to this one. I've got uh, some friends coming up from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So happy to be hosting them this weekend. They're happy to see the weather forecast in South Bend after spitting snow earlier this week. is sunny and 75 on Saturday afternoon. So we'll, uh, we'll make the short trek. It's nine-tenths of a mile from my driveway to the era Parsegian gate at Notre Dame stadium. So uh, we'll make the the short amble over to the stadium and check this one out. It's, it's a key game for Notre Dame. Um, it's, it's a pivot point, not just because it's the midway point of the season. The Irish have not played very well at home, but when you look big picture and see the meat, the very chunky meat still on the bone of Notre Dame's schedule, they go to Syracuse very soon. They have Clemson coming here to South Bend the first week of November. The last week of November, they go play Lincoln Riley in the Coliseum. They still got a game against Navy and Baltimore mixed in there. And they've still got Boston College, which when healthy, Boston College can throw up some points. So this is a crucial, crucial game for Notre Dame to continue trying to build what they wish to build under Marcus Freeman, but also – um, you had so many fifth and sixth year guys come back for this season. They need this win to to still entertain bowl eligibility down the road. West Virginia heads to Texas Tech. Zach, any quick thoughts? Uh, Texas uh, West Virginia got a, a win they needed to have at home against Baylor last Thursday. Texas Tech needs to win this game at home. If you if if you are a uh, you know within the the middle of the pack of the Big Twelve, which you know the middle of the pack might be all 10 teams who knows you got to win your home games uh they, they got that huge win against texas at home the, texas tech has they can't afford to to lose to west virginia at home and, and reach their their goals and can we back up and talk about the kansas baylor game i continue to be worried about i i think there's a very good chance kansas starts five and oh and ends up five and seven they uh they're they're just decimated on defense uh they they lost their probably their best defensive player kobe bryant was carted off the field last week, looked like a bad ankle injury. They gave up 700 yards, could have been 60 points to can't, to Oklahoma last week. So uh, they're, they're going to be underdogs uh, for every game. So I think there's a, a greater than 50% chance at this point they end up 5-7, and seven, except for someone make the joke they still have. 
Who they who does Kansas still have on their schedule? I won't even say it. Okay. All right. It's not even, it's not even nice. Not play. Okay. They're back. Oh dear. Uh, Ole Miss at LSU. John Bryce just said his uh, his 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 amble to the stadium is nine tenths of a mile. I was like, man, I live pretty close to Tiger Stadium. Let me see. I just did a quick Google. I'm ten minutes from LSU. Three point eight miles. It's a little surprising. I've made the walk a few times. I ride my bike a few times. Good talk. <laughs> Ole Miss coming into Tiger Stadium. Uh, two weeks ago, I think everybody would have said Ole Miss is going to go in there and, and, and win fairly, you know, a couple touchdowns. Uh, Tigers look pretty good. <laughs> they, they went down to Florida, and, and they, they won that game straight away. All four of us picked Florida, and we talked about that game ahead of time. We're like, ah, LSU, they can't go in the swamp and win. And they were, they were in control of that game. Pretty much throughout. I mean, Florida scored first, but I remember LSU leading pretty much the entire way from yeah. from that point on. And you really the various, you know, advanced stats I see they they see this as a toss up game. So I don't, this, but they do. This is the type of game that Lane Kiffin. I mean, he lives for this thing. He loves this. He will be so prepared. He will revel in the day. He will love it. Um, Gosh, it's gonna be fun. I don't know. I'll be in there. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I just sent my, my picks <clears throat> to Zach, so I don't care to tell you. I'm picking LSU in this game. Look, if, if you can go win <clears throat> the way that the Tigers did and bounce back to the way that they did, more so than winning was the fact that they came off of an absolutely abysmal performance against Tennessee and played far and away their most complete game of the season at Florida. If you can do that at Florida, you're going to get a lot of your fans back on board. Um, I think that this is an LSU program very clearly growing each week in, under Brian Kelly and the rest of that staff. And I just think that um, Ole Miss still is working out some issues at quarterback. Jackson Dart has done some nice things, but this is still the team that looked poised to run Kentucky out of Oxford a, a few weeks ago and then had to get a solitary field goal in the second half at home and struggle to hang on and really get two defensive miracles to hang on against Kentucky. I just think home field advantage and um, the growth of LSU is the difference in this game. So Ole Miss is running for over 270 yards a game, which if that holds up through the end of the season would be the most by any SEC team since 2019. But, John, to your point, I think this season, this last weekend, and then everything we've seen at Notre Dame has been an education that for everything, you know, prickly about his personality – Brian Kelly is a professional head football coach, and he will have LSU ready to play its best game. The um, I agree with you, and I think Matt House has really done a very nice job stabilizing there, and they made some tweaks in offense, and all of a sudden things are starting to, to click a little bit. The area of LSU that you're like, what is going on with special teams? Uh, and it, uh, it's – okay. Moving on, UCLA, Oregon, huge game. This is one I'm super excited about. I'm going to be at Tiger Stadium, so I'm not going to be able to see this one live. But this has incredible potential. Trying to find some daylight between these teams, at least statistically, is really hard to do. They're the two best teams in the Pac-12 on the ground, both running the ball and stopping the run. So I, I think, you know, first off, the team that, that wins on the ground is going to win the game. I think, you know, DTR is playing the best quarterback of his nine years at UCLA. I still don't trust Bo Nix to uh, – to, I, I, don't, I don't trust Bo Nix in, in high leverage situations. I think he's going to give you UCLA a pick. UCLA, for, for the, the sissy blue uniforms that Ed Ogeron taught them, they, they are a tough football team. They're a tough physical team. And I think Chip Kelly goes to Austin and wins. They're an older football team too, Zach, and I think that that's really key, um, not just – um, in this singular game, but what the Bruins are doing th this season. They're one of the older teams in all of the Pac-12. They're one of the older Power 5 football teams. They've still got a lot of guys that have been there slogging along the way with Chip Kelly since he arrived at UCLA. So I don't think the Bruins will be intimidated by the environment or, or any of those things. But I do think the environment is going to play an impact in this. If I'm not mistaken, this is where game day is this weekend. or mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so I, I just think that – uh, Oregon is really thirsty for this moment. We've continued to see Oregon improve really week on top of week since that Georgia disaster. 
Uh, and much like Ole Miss LSU, I think UCLA Oregon is a toss up game. And in that scenario, I'm going with the home team. I've been out to Autzen when they're rocking and rolling. It's pretty awesome to uh, have that scene there in the midst of all those evergreen trees and people going crazy and the duck riding his Harley out onto the field. So uh, I don't have a Harley, but I'm riding with the ducks. I'm going to share a quick story. This is years ago. This chips at um, chips head coach at Oregon. I mean, it tells you how long ago this was. I go out there. Uh, it happens to be the, the day and night before their pro day the next day. So I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm in the office all day long. Chip says, Hey, why don't you come to dinner with us? The whole staff's going out to dinner. Sure. Go to dinner. And I just happen to get seated next to Chip and he's on fire. He has given me some of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life that night. We're having a big night. Great, great fun time. We're at a steakhouse. Everything's great. Time to roll. And I mean, I think, I think we're leaving. I think we're going to the hotel and they open, like we're in this private room. They open the doors and I'm not kidding you. It's like half the general managers in the NFL and like almost every scout I've ever met. They all just they're they're in the bar. And I'm like, what's going on here? guys? And obviously they knew the chip and the staff were there. They weren't there to see me. Maybe, maybe not. They were there to see chip and the staff. And so we all wind up hanging out for like two or three hours. I had more fun. Those NFL scouts can tell stories and NFL GMs. These are professional storytellers. Do you ever want to have fun? Go talk to those guys at the bar with Chip Kelly present. One of the more enjoyable nights in the football school career. Scott Roussel. Good talk. We'll talk about that some other night. Texas, Oklahoma State. Zach, give me some fun. This is a this is a bizarro world game for me because you look at the various numbers, like find a computer ranking. They've got Texas in the top five, Oklahoma State 15 to 20. Uh, projections of this game give Texas a, a two and three to a three and four chance to win the game. You know, Texas's numbers are better. You know, they're uh, Oklahoma, they're top 15 in yards per play defense. Oklahoma State is in the middle of the pack. Um, Oklahoma State struggles to run the ball without Spencer Sanders. Like, they, this is not an Oklahoma State team that can just run, line up and run the ball with just running back. Uh, skill talent seems to be down from where it's been. Uh, Texas is six and a touchdown favorite last I checked. And I I'm processing all this. And then I'm looking at an Oklahoma state team. That's like 16 and four against the spread in its last 20 games. The last time they were an underdog, they've won straight up like four times. Texas history on the road history against ranked teams is really, really bad. You know, Steve Sarkeesian is one and four, one and five on the road. So I'm just trying to square the teams that on paper, Texas looks like the better team. And in reality, I mean, we've just seen Oklahoma State win games like this for years and years and years and years. And I think I think Texas is catching Oklahoma State at the right time. Spencer Sanders is very banged up. Uh, you know, the end of that TCU game, he seemed to, to wear down his shoulder. He just couldn't get enough juice on the ball. How willing is he going to be to run the ball? I don't know. If he doesn't run the ball, does Oklahoma State's offense really work without him running the ball? I could see Oklahoma State winning this game, and I could see Texas winning this game. I, I pick Texas, but I don't feel good about it at all. I think um, I think the line has, has drifted closer to almost a pick em. I think that Texas okay. is maybe favored by a point, a point and a half at this point. Um, you guys know I'm going with Texas. Uh, the horns are my bold prediction coming into the season. I'm certainly not going to abandon them right now. For me – um, it's just two programs entering on different footing because of what happened a week ago. And we saw Oklahoma State in complete command against TCU and um, not only fall in that game, but, but lose that lead so late, then play a couple of overtimes and then lose the game. And we saw Texas uh, vanquish some demons by the way that it was able to uh, come back against Iowa State and win that game. And so I get what you're saying, Zach, because – We've seen when um, Texas was supposed to be back in previous years uh, find a way to lose this type of game. But I expect the Longhorns now, uh, especially with the running of Bijan Robinson, to find a way to win this game. Yeah, the most encouraging thing by far of that Iowa State game was that that last drive. Iowa State has the best run defense in the Big 12 and still does even after that game. And they fell behind 21-17 and just ran the ball right down Iowa State's throats. Didn't 
throw the ball to any no one other than Bijan or Roshan touched the ball until the final play of the drive. Like it was just straight up big boy football. So if the offensive line can continue to improve week to week, then perhaps Texas takes control of that one from that respect. Oklahoma State's not that great against the run. Or perhaps Spencer Sanders uh, and Mike Gundy do some things and then Oklahoma State wins. I, I could see either thing happening. Always a great environment, Stillwater. All right. Top 25 ranked Tulane. Willie Fritz getting it done. You know, we I think all three of us have been big fans of Willie Fritz and the way he does things for a long, long time. Top 25 program. Love it. Got Memphis coming to town. Memphis is at a weird point in their season. I think they're four and three. They got Tulane here. I think they go, I think they have UCF thereafter. If the wave wins, if UCF wins, Memphis four and five. And I think they got a I think they got a an FCS program still down the line and maybe a softer game, maybe, but not not a marquee season for Memphis. No, no and it was a it was a key season for Memphis. Um <clears throat> for Ryan Silverfield and company. And they, they had the loss to ECU here recently. Um, they lost to, against Houston. You're right. Now they have this road game against Tulane. They still have UCF coming in. Um, and they still have to go to SMU. So it's a, it's a tough schedule uh, still out there for Memphis. This is a game. It's a pivot point game for the Tigers season, much like we talked about with Notre Dame. Um, are you pivoting forward? Or are you pivoting backward? If uh, Memphis finds a way to win this game on the road, then you clearly think the Tigers can pivot forward. But I like Tulane in this game. Yeah, Memphis lost, you know, gagged away lead the last two games. It's just – it's tough to, to – <coughs> when you lose a double-digit lead twice in a row, it's just tough to wash that taste out of your mouth. Like the, the human element, you know, it, it's just it's just tough to, to – hit refresh and move on from that. And Tulane's really good. Yeah. Um, Tulane is very good. I think Tulane wins the game. My pause and my caution is Tulane goes, beats Kansas State, and then falters at home to Southern Miss. You're like, what? So they're in the top 25 now. Let's not falter again. I think Willie Fitz will, Fritz will have them prepared. Uh, let's just see it happen. Let's, let's prove ourselves now. All right. For those who don't know it, every Thursday, Zach publishes on footballscoop.com the biggest games of the weekend on the line. Classic Zach Barnett line in there. <laughs> BYU earlier took on the Catholics to no avail. <laughs> Can they beat the evangelicals? BYU at Liberty. Give me a couple quick thoughts on this one. I, I continue to think BYU is a better team than apparently they they prove. I picked them to, to beat Notre Dame. They were clearly the uh, worst team on the field that day. I, I'm going to ride with BYU all the way down. I think they go across country. They, they go to the mountains of Virginia and the, the latter day saints defeat the evangelicals. I love the, uh, I love the, the theme there, Zach. I did. Uh, I was in Vegas for that BYU Notre Dame game and I called it the uh, sin city, Holy war because you mm -hmm. had the uh, Catholics versus Mormons um, and, and they colored that town Royal blue and green and gold. And it, it was pretty awesome. Uh, you know, who is this Liberty team, this Liberty team that, that really had a chance to beat a, a extremely good Wake Forest team uh, and lost like 37 to 36? Or is this the Liberty team that scuffled and needed a late score to get past uh, FCS Gardner-Webb last week, 21 to 20? And then who is this BYU team that um, has looked so good at times this year and had the big win early in the season against Baylor, but then got flat out shoved around? by Oregon, by Notre Dame, and then last week by Arkansas? Uh, that, that to me is a great question, uh, but I'm excited for this matchup because I think it's going to be one of the weekend's more entertaining games. All right. There are probably 10 more games in that 230 window. I'd love to talk about, but we're 30-plus minutes in, and I got a bunch of games in the 6 o'clock window, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to throw a softball to Zach because he deserves a softball every now and then. Zach, give me thoughts on uh, North Texas UTSA. Yes, here we go. Uh, so this is a uh, – obviously, the, these teams did not play for the first time since 2013, but this is this is an underrated rivalry. They've got some real – their first game, UTSA went to Denton and upset a North Texas team that I still think was the best team in Conference USA that year. Uh, last year, uh, UTSA was undefeated, 
rolling in the top 15 and just got beat up by North Texas. North Texas won that game by 20 points. UNT has won seven straight Conference USA games. UTSA is 14 and one in Conference USA since the beginning of last season. So uh, top two teams in the conference. North Texas has one of the best running teams in, in college football. They've been top five ever since the middle of last year. Um, Frank Harris is maybe the most underrated player in college football. He's top five in total offense. Absolute stud. U- UTSA is at home, a 10-point favorite. But Jeff Trailer was asked uh, yesterday to, to describe his team health, his team's health, and he gave him an F for failure. Like, they are just beat up all over the roster. Because of that, I still think UT, uh, in spite of that, I still think UTSA wins. But this is a too bad it's on stadium because it, it's going to be tough to, to monitor this game. But this is a game to, to keep an eye on because it's going to be a good one. Uh, I, anytime somebody says something on stadium, I don't even. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Roadrunners. Moving on. Um, I'm just going to point this one out real quick. John, you might have some quick thoughts, but real quick. Vanderbilt's at Missouri. Missouri cannot afford to lose this game. Just simply cannot afford to lose this game. It's at home. You got Vanderbilt. I think Missouri has lost three in a row. I don't think the schedule gets any easier. They need to win this game. They do need to win this game. Missouri coming off of its bye week. Um, I look for the Tigers to, to get a win, but it, it's a pivotal, pivotal time of the season, a pivotal time of his juncture thus far. In, in Columbia, Missouri for Eli Drinkwitz. Big, big game for a lot of different reasons. I'm going to move us down to the 6 o'clock uh, window. And, of course, I'm talking central time because why else would anyone talk about any other time? Well, I noticed just uh, passing, there are some games in the 4 o'clock window. Arkansas State, Louisiana Lafayette, Southern Miss, Texas State. That's the 4 o'clock window. Okay, moving along. Mississippi State, Alabama. Anybody think Mike Leach's squad has a, has a shot? Uh, I would just say, first of all, uh, condolences to the Mississippi State football family and, and the death of the, the young man, Mr. S. Moreland. Um, just a tragic situation. He would have been 19 on Friday. Um, it's almost an impossible task to play a football game on the heels of tragedy like that. And, and honestly, um, you know, I wish they didn't even have to play this weekend. Um, for, for just this just exposes how much bigger life is than, than football. And so um, it, under normal circumstances, I think you would believe that the Mississippi state might've had a shot at, at this. Um, but I think uh, with just such tragedy off the field um, on that side of things and Alabama probably feeling like it left a lot on the field last weekend against Tennessee. Um, I think the Crimson Tide role in this game, but I can't stress enough um my prayers and thoughts going out to the Mississippi State football family. Amen. Agree. Minnesota goes to Penn State. Minnesota's going to try and get right. Penn State beaten up a little bit at the big house. How's this one play out? Minnesota is one of the weirdest teams in college football because you look at their schedule and it's like they beat Western Illinois, Colorado might be the worst power five team. They beat uh, – uh, New Mexico State, and then they won one conference game against someone that I don't know off the top of my head, but it wasn't good. They, they've they lost their last two games. Um, they, they beat Michigan State at home. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then they lost to Purdue. They lost to Illinois by double digits. You think, okay, this is a middle of the road as middle of the road gets. But you look at every different metric, and I don't know what goes into these metrics, but I, I – I put some stock into them, and they're top 10 team in the country. Up and down. Minnesota Golden Gophers, top 10 team in the country. Their defensive numbers are really good. Penn State was exposed, beaten up, embarrassed, brutalized by Michigan. Can they go on the road and win at Beaver Stadium? Maybe, but I trust my eyes. What my eyes have told me that this is an average Minnesota team, so I think I think, I think Penn State gets it done. So – 10 first downs in a game, 18 minutes time of possession, less than 260 yards offense. You think I've got to be talking about Iowa, right? No, that's Penn State last week. That, that, that would have been a hell of a day for Iowa. But nonetheless, that's really putrid offensive numbers, especially with a veteran quarterback like Sean Clifford. Um, he barely threw for like 
maybe 115 yards or something like that. They rushed for barely 100 plus yards, um, just completely thoroughly overmatched, especially the finally final 30 minutes of that contest last weekend in Ann Arbor. Um, but I do think that Penn State's defense is enough along with home field to lift the Nittany Lions this week. But it's a it's a key game for these two programs. Penn State absolutely cannot allow the old um, adage to come into play here where Michigan beats them twice. Amen. I think the Nitt- Nittany Lions have enough. We'll see. I don't have great confidence in that, but I like Penn State in this one. A&M at South Carolina. This one's going to get weird. I'm just telling you it is, and it's going to be fun. Yeah, so Jimbo – said a Monday that Haynes King was going to start good to go. And then I'm just seeing, hearing from people that's like, Oh no, Haynes King in playing Connor Wigman's playing. And I I've heard from, I've heard from lots of Aggies in my life that they wanted, they wanted Wigman, the, the, the five-star freshman to play last week or two weeks ago in the Alabama game. I was like, are you, are you, are you sure? Are you, are, are you putting, are you processing the words that are coming out of your mouth? You want, <laughs> This five true freshman to play his first game against Alabama. All we hear is that Jimbo's offense is too complicated, takes three years to learn it, and now you want a true freshman who to go out and play. So I don't know who's playing at quarterback. I don't know what to expect. I picked South Carolina to win the game. YOLO. Yeah, I actually took the Gamecocks as well. Talked to some folks in Columbia this week. I think South Carolina has won what, three games in a row coming off a bye week. Um, And and another thing is I don't believe South Carolina has ever beaten A&M since those two teams joined the SEC. So with that in mind, um, home home field, Beamer has the belief level very high. Um, And it's a key way for for South Carolina to close the back half of the season. But if South Carolina could go and win at Kentucky while the Wildcats were having some offensive issues and didn't have Will Levis, then I think Spencer Rattler – and company have the ability to win at home. <clears throat> yeah, they have the ability. It's not a great South Carolina team, but they have the ability. I would agree with you. So we'll see. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a weird one, and I think it's going to be a fun one. Like twenty four twenty. I mean, it's yeah. going to yeah. be. <clears throat> yeah, it's going to be close, fun. fun. Something strange is going to happen, and it'll be glorious college football. Great environment there. All right, I don't want to talk much about this one. I want to mention it. UCF East Carolina has potential. Has potential. Gus got things right. It, it didn't, it wasn't easy, but he seems to have gotten things right on the offensive side. East Carolina is a, a well-coached football team. Could, could be a fun one, but I'm going to move us on. K-State TCU, huge game, Zach. Give me, give me what you got on this one. Yeah. So TCU, uh, do, do, are they just riding the, the momentous high of, of winning three straight, you know, spotlight games? To, to what's one more bring it on we're at home at night no one can bring us down or are they are they beaten up exhausted tired from from you know winning a, a fourth quarter game in a raucous atmosphere at kansas and then winning a, a double overtime game against oklahoma state like do they have enough in the tank do they have enough to run with with uh, adrian martinez and deuce vaughn 35 times maybe 40 45 times on saturday night tcu has the best running game in in the big 12 so this is a both teams want to spread you out to run the ball. So whichever team does that more effectively is going to win. I think I think TCU wins the game, but I I could see K-State winning. The thing, Sonny Dykes, throughout his career, he started 5-0 and or better every year since he's been at SMU, four straight years, and then lost multiple games down the stretch. Obviously, we haven't seen that played out at TCU. I'm expecting the shoe to drop at some point. Like At some point, they're going to falter. Is it this week? I'll, I'll ride with the Horn Frogs at home at night. Yeah, I don't think it's this week, but I agree with you, Zach. The Horn Frogs still have three key roadies left at West Virginia, at Texas, and at Baylor. Uh, so I still think this ends up probably being a multiple loss TCU team. Um, but Cinderella's not taking the shoe off this week. Yeah, I'm with TCU on this week as well. All right, quick hits. Pitt, Louisville. Louisville got shot? Yeah. Louisville got shot. It's at home. Um, Louisville has played better. Uh really been in, in essentially every single game other than that opener against Syracuse. We know what's on the line. We know Satterfield has to stack wins. Flip side of that is we know Pitt has been beaten up, banged up, and disappointed with some things that it's done. Um, so you've got 
the stability of the Pitt program against the instability of the Louisville program. But Louisville still has some nice playmakers. Washington and Cal. Cal. I mean, they they, they brought in Steve Greatwood this week to, to help the offense. I mean, 13 points against Colorado, lose the game. Washington, you know, not top 25 material, but they're better than they were last year. Michael Penix Jr., Great court, you know, great quarterback and Kalen DeBoer, solid head coach. I think, I think Washington goes to Berkeley and, and wins the game. Yeah, I, I think Penix is dynamic enough to to get it done f- for Washington. And, and look, you, you just can't lose to that Colorado team. So uh, I saw that Cal team in person. They got some really nice personnel on both sides of the ball, but especially defensively. Um, but making a coordinator switch at this point um, and in the middle of the the season, I just don't see it clicking that quickly all right any closing thoughts any games you want to touch on before we get shut this thing down campbell jackson state oh I've written about it i'm genuinely excited about it it's on espn plus i have to see how i can see the game uh, on my phone or on my ipad or something while i'm also uh, at notre dame stadium um but you know when you think about notre dame you also think about campbell and jackson state that's just where your mind goes as a college football fanatic I'm genuinely fired up for this game. I'm fired up for this game for the attention that it's generating. Both Mike Mentor at Campbell and Deion Sanders at Jackson State, or as Mike Mentor told me, the greatest salesman on the face of the earth. Um, But there's great, great talent in this game, too. There have been, Mike Mentor told me, all 32 NFL scouts have been by his program since August. We know how often the NFL scouts are checking out Deion and Jackson State. So, um, I would encourage people, if you don't see it live, and it will be hard to see this game live, I'm pretty sure ESPN is going to replay it sometime on Sunday. Find the replay. I may watch the replay Sunday rather than a live NFL game. I'm that genuinely excited for it. The other one would be I'm wearing the shirt, um, but Furman has a huge weekend coming up. Sanford, which is playing lights out, goes to ETSU this weekend. So there's a ton of fun in the SoCon as well. Always is. Zach, any final thoughts? Uh, don't watch NFL tonight. What Virginia, Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech's 2-0 and under alum interim head coach Brent Key. Could move to 3-0. and And then keep your eyes on, on Troy, South Alabama. That Watch that game. Don't watch the NFL. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly. Week 8, it will not disappoint. I'm telling you right now, Week eight's going to wind up somehow being more ham than Week 7. Epic. Yeah, I'm telling you, uh, tied Bama, you can't top that. That was incredible. But there's going to be great ball across the country. It's going to be a great weekend. Every week is great. Football Scoop Podcast, we are out. Always fun. Tell your wife, tell your friends, tell your neighbor. Appreciate everybody's uh, support. Talk soon. Bye-bye.